is one associative day. Uh, so our first speaker now is uh, Dan Fox from the Universidad Politécnica de Madrid. And he will talk about sectional non-associativity of metrized algebra. So whenever you want, Dan. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, uh, thanks to the organizers for the opportunity to speak here today. Um, so um, if, if I, at some point I get a little distracted, it's just simply today's a holiday in Spain and, and I have a whole family in the next room um, and I, I'm trying to ignore the noise they're making, but the, uh, I will do my best to concentrate. The, the, the idea today is, is really, it is to, is, to, is to talk about the, the notion of sexual non-associativity, which I hope is, is a, a way that maybe gives a, a, a different way of organizing how one thinks about uh, classes of non-associative algebra is a little bit different than say uh, identities, for example, like what we saw in, in the previous talk and, and, and some of the other things that we've seen today. Uh, it's, it's, this is a early stages of a project in a sense. And so the, the talk will be example heavy and, and there are uh, not so many theorems, um, but, but uh, let me just get started with some basic things and, and, uh, and to set the stage. So when I say an algebra, I just am gonna mean a completely arbitrary algebra. Uh, so I, I, I'm used to saying these things because I'm used to speaking to people that don't have such a background as in algebra as the audience here, but um, it, it, in particular, it, it, it's certainly not associative, and, and although in much of the talk I will actually focus on commutative non-associative algebras, uh, to begin with, it, it need not be commutative, unital, or anything else. And I'll write L and R for the, the left and right multiplication endomorphisms, and I'll write uh, the underlying bracket that's defined in this way uh, with, with the usual sort of bracket notation, and I'll write this, this circle with a dot to indicate the symmetrized product. Many people would normally put in a half here, but I'm just so that these are defined in parallel. I'm leaving out the halves. And that means at some points, of course, that there will be twos and fours and formulas that probably shouldn't be. But at any rate, I, the, the base field in general will be arbitrary. Although at some cases, I'm actually going to specialize to the real numbers or, or, or the complex numbers. And, uh, and I'm always going to be assuming that it's not characteristic two and usually not also three. Uh, just to not run into problems. Um, and some things genuinely won't work in those low characteristics. And I'll write the associator this way. And, and in particular, at some point, I'll, I'll want to have it expressed in terms of these left multiplication operators. And I'll write AXY for the, the associator viewed as an endomorphism in its last argument. Is an op yeah, so, okay, so. And just to motivate a little bit what I, what I I want to talk about, I want to introduce some notions that somehow come from, are inspired by differential geometry. And, and the, the analogy at first actually appears very naive, and maybe it is very naive, but but it's actually not completely an analogy. In some sense, it's, it's, a, it's a little bit of, of an actual correspondence. And if, if you, so here, just think about a connection on tangent bundle. So you can think of it as a product. It, it, given two vector fields, you get a, uh, you get a new one, which is x times y. And this is somehow, um, this makes the space of vector fields on the manifold uh, an infinite dimensional uh, real algebra. And you're somehow ignoring structure when you do this because of course the, the axioms of a, of a covariant derivative uh, require this to be a module map in its first argument to satisfy the Leibniz rule in its second argument. And you're, you're somehow, I'm just forgetting about that, but that, that's okay. So the, the, the statement that the connection is torsion free uh, from an algebraic point of view is saying it's a Lie admissible algebra. Uh, moreover, the underlying Lie bracket is the usual Lie bracket of vector fields. So, and, and then uh, the, the curvature, if you want to think about it in, in just sort of purely algebraic terms, well, if, if you write out the curvature as, as the anti-symmetrization of this object here up to sign, uh, you, you can just express the curvature in terms of the associator of this product. And so it's, it's really just the, it's basically the, the, the thing that would vanish if your algebra were left symmetric. And, and of course, I, this observation is the origin of the study of left symmetric algebras because on a, on a homogeneous uh, manifold with a homogeneous connection, um, this in fact all makes completely good sense at the Lie algebra level, um, not just at this infinite dimensional R algebra level. So in fact, the flatness of the connection is somehow the same thing as as, as, as this product is left symmetric. 
And, and just for later use, I'm gonna write the, the Ritchie curvature is in these terms becomes the trace of, of, of this is like the right associator. So on the previous slide, I had written the associator in terms of L. If I wrote the associator in terms of R, that's essentially what I'm tracing here. Okay, so so that, that will show up later. So please uh, feel free to interrupt me with questions. I, I'm quite quite fond of questions. So if, if you're at all confused. So the, the basic philosophy of, of how the notions I'm gonna describe where they're obtained is 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 you is you think of the space of affine connections as a as a, as a vector space you fix a reference connection so you can write any other connection as as, it, as as by adding to the reference connection some tensor and this tensor has the same symmetries basically as the structure tensor of an algebra and so you you, you look at an expression like covariant derivative of a metric and you write it out and you just forget about the terms that involve derivatives and and in in, the, in this sense. And, 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 and wherever you see uh, covariant derivatives, you substitute it by a multiplication and you get out some condition that now makes sense just on algebras. And, and so, so that, that you have a parallel metric would be the same thing as you have some symmetric bilinear form, which satisfies this identity here, this, this one here. And if, if, what I actually is gonna interest me more is a, is a slightly weaker condition. So that's this condition here where I'm considering the, the, the skew symmetrization of the covariant derivative of the metric and its first two arguments vanishes. So some sort of Kodazi Hessian condition. And, and at the algebra level, that becomes this condition, which will be familiar to people who have thought about um, metrics on less symmetric algebras. Um, and I'm actually gonna focus on the special case of this when, when if I have a commutative algebra, then this last term here vanishes and I'm just left with the, this, these two terms are equal. And if I'm assuming that G is symmetric, it, it, what it essentially means is this trilinear form built from the metric and the multiplication is completely symmetric. And so it, for commutative algebras, that's gonna be the, the, the notion that I'm gonna be using this notion. So this is somehow just a general principle and it, it actually, it, it's very naive, but it leads to surprisingly rich class of ideas. And, and I'm, I'm gonna try to, explain a, a few of them today. That's sort of the, the so let me let me actually now start making some definitions. And so when I say a metrized algebra, I'm going to mean I have a well by a metric, I'm just going to mean a non-degenerate symmetric bilinear form. And in general, given a symmetric bilinear form, I'm going to say it's invariant if, if it satisfies this condition here. Uh, now here I'm not supposing now that the algebra is is, is commutative. It could be anti commutative for instance, for instance, on a Lie algebra, this is exactly the invariance to the killing form, the same condition. And so, um, and in that case, of course, it would mean that this uh, trilinear form is complete, is, is, is completely anti-symmetric. And I'll, I'll call it algebra metrizable if it admits such a, an invariant metric. And here I'm putting a parentheses left because there's there's an analogous notion on the right. When you're looking at commutative and any commutative algebras, L and R are the same up to a sign, left and right multiplication are the same up to a sign. And so some of the, there's no need to speak about left and right. And that, that's mostly going to be the case in what I what I speak of in, the, in what follows. In, in any case, if, if I don't say left, I just mean it on the left in general. This is like when one has to pick a side. Um, and uh, I will call a metrized algebra uh, Euclidean if, if the metric is positive definite. Of course, for this to make sense, I need some assumption on my base field. For instance, that it be the real numbers or that it be a Euclidean field. Um, and so I, when this condition operates, I'm always assuming such a condition on the base field. It makes sense to speak of positive. And I'll call a metrized commutative algebra commutative algebra is equipped with the metric in this sense, and I'll abbreviate that as MCA. So here are just some quick examples of metrized algebras that just to see that some examples that probably are familiar to everybody here. Uh, a Jordan algebra with th this form, which is the trace of the, 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 the multiplication endomorphism. So a Jordan algebra is commutative. And, and so here I, I'm looking at the trace of, of the left multiplication endomorphism evaluated on the product. And I, I like to call that the Kozul form for some reason. 
uh, it's not completely standard terminology, but it's to distinguish it from some of the other trace forms that will show up in what follows. For a Lie algebra or a more general Maltsev algebra, which is one satisfying this identity here, which I've hopefully written correctly, um, the such algebras are, are, are metrized by their killing form. And the killing form is a different trace form. Um, and here I say in parentheses, e.g. E cross product algebras, uh, the, the standard examples of Maltsev algebras are the imaginary quaternions and the imaginary actonians with the, with the bracket, with the anti commutative bracket induced from the quaternion and octonian multiplication. And, um, and then as a third example that's probably familiar, Hurwitz algebra, which would be, which, by which I mean a unital composition algebra. So it's, a, it's an algebra equipped with a quadratic form, which is multiplicative in this, in this sense here. And then by polarizing that, that quadratic form, you get a metric and that metric actually can be expressed in terms of the trace. Here, the X bar refers to the canonical conjugation on the Hurwitz algebra. So over the real numbers of Hurwitz algebras are the real numbers, the complex numbers, quaternions, and octonians, they all come equipped with the usual conjugation. So that's what's, that's what's here. And, and so in all of these sort of standard examples, of metrized algebras, the metric is actually given by some particular trace form. And um, I think that's worth commenting because in general, the, the, the class of metrized algebras is too big to say anything interesting. It's too, it's got too little structure. But uh, if, you, if you decide to start looking at a particular trace form, um, things become more restricted. There's still, if you think about Lie algebras, there's still a lot of possibilities, but so what do I mean by trace forms? Just to just to make this a little clearer, I just mean so here I'm I'm thinking of a commutative algebra, an anti-commutative algebra, and, and I mean traces of products of powers of the of the of the multiplication endomorphism, um, things of this form, perhaps involving also iterated products inside. And if I were working with a a general algebra, I'd have to say traces of products of powers of L and R, not just L. But fine, it, I'm trying to keep things as simple as possible. So if I look at the level of linear trace forms, if I'm on a say a commutative or any commutative algebra, the only choice is this one, the trace of the multiplication endomorphism itself. And I'm gonna call a commutative algebra exact if, if this is always zero. Uh, for a Lie algebra, the, the analogous condition is unimodularity. And um, is there a question I hear? Ask a spontaneous example of non trace form, which is okay, not of this AQR form, which is uh, okay. an algebra that will be the trice of the which is not. I, 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 don't, I, don't, I, don't, I, I can't hear very well the question. But... You cannot hear me. Huh? Now I can hear you better, yes. Okay. Uh, my question is do you have some example? Of a metrized algebra which is not PQR in this notation. Uh, that's not metrized by a trace form. Uh, it's easy to write down examples. Uh, there are many. Um, the, the, I guess the easiest example would be what are called quadratic Lie algebras. You take an, a certain no potent Lie algebras and you can write down a an invariant bilinear a, a, a metric on them. Not all no potent Lie algebras admit invariant metrics, but it's, some do, and when they do, it's not the killing form. It's not a trace form. Not believe to do, okay, to, to, to believe because that. because in fact, if you have if if you have a non-degenerate trace form of this form, it follows from a theorem of Dudenne that the algebra is semi-simple. Yes, right. Yes. Uh, and and so so if you if you have if you have something like a notebook Lie algebra with a invariant metric on it, it's not a trace form in this sense. Yeah. Um, I don't know if I've answered the question really, but mm -hmm. and the the I guess at some point I'll I'll make this assumption about exactness, um, and in this case, so so so, so the, the if I'm in the commutative or any commutative sense, sort of the most general bilinear trace form I can write down is this one here. It's a combination of these three, and and uh, but if if I'm assuming an exact algebra, really the only thing it's possible is a, is a multiple of the killing form. So that, that somehow singles out the killing form as, as for some reason is, is interesting. Um, and, and then I'm actually gonna 
it's mentioned quite a lot in this talk, this, 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 this Ritchie form. And if, if we go back a few slides um, here, this is somehow the trace of the associated, the associated endomorphism. And so that, that's why it's going to, it's vanishing is a very weak form of kind of associativity. And the sort of geometric condition I have in mind is I, is I want to think about algebras which are a priori metrized by some, by some metric and, and, and where in fact that metric is, is, is a multiple of the Ritchie form or said the other way, the Ritchie form is a multiple of that metric. And, and I want to think of that as something like an Einstein-like condition. And that's somehow where in the same sense that the Ritchie tensor being a multiple of the metric is, is the Einstein condition for a, for a metric on a manifold. And um, so it's, it's somehow th this, this kind of notion that I want to give, give some sense to. And, 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 and so that's going to lead me to my, my notion of sexual associativity. So I want to think about the, in the differential geometric context, the sort of the classical hi curvature hierarchy. You have, you have really three different things. You have constant sectional curvature, which says that the Riemann curvature tensor of the metric is a multiple. Uh, it's, this is the Kolkarni nomitsu product up to sign and, and, and the normalization. It's just, it's basically, uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a curv it's a tensor with curvature tensor symmetries constructed from the metric. And so the condition of constant sectional curvature is just exactly that the Riemannian curvature tensor is a multiple of it. And my sign convention is such that for the constant sectional curvature to be kappa, I need this minus sign here. Um, and then if we trace this in an appropriate way, we get the Einstein equation, which tells us that the Ritchie curvature is a multiple of the, of the metric. The multiple has to be the scalar curvature divided by the dimension. Um, uh, here, uh, this, you can also write it in terms of the Einstein tensor and the, and the, and the metric. And this is sort of how a physicist would write it on the right. But really here, I'm going to think about it in this way on the left. And then of course, you have this very weak condition of constant scalar curvature, which here isn't going to operate much. It's too, it's too weak in the general algebraic context to give us anything interesting. But, and then the final thing I want to comment is, 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 is stated here in the Beltrami theorem, which is how I want to think about constant sectional curvature. I want to think about constant sectional curvature as projective flatness of the levity Civita connection. So for those who haven't thought about uh, projective flatness, uh, what, what projectively flat means for a connection is that if I look at the images of its geodesics, so unparameterized geodesics, there are locally charts in which they are, they can be realized as straight lines. And, and it's, it's, uh, it's, this is characterized for an arbitrary affine connection, torsion-free affine connection is characterized by the vanishing of the trace-free part of the full curvature tensor, um, which is sometimes called the, the vial the projective vial tensor, um, except in dimension two, where one has to one has to do special things in low dimension space. But, and uh, it, it's a it's a classical theorem attributed to Beltrami that that a metric has constant sectional curvature if and only if its levi chivita connection is projectively flat in this sense. So so projective space, the, the round Fubini study metric on the sphere, and and of course flat. Uh, Euclidean space are all projectively flat in this sense, and locally, that's that's the only possibilities for a Riemannian metric. This this theorem is true in any signature, so it's true for pseudo Riemannian metrics as well. And um, yeah, and I'll just leave out this last little remark. Um, it's not terribly. So I, the point is, I, I want to. It's relevant for me to think of this constant sectional curvature condition as a as projective flatness, and this is a point to which I'm going to return. Later in the talk, I'm going to give some purely algebraic analog of this Beltrami theorem. Uh, first, I'm going to generalize what it means to talk about sectional curvature, and then I'm going to explain its relationship with, with the appropriate notion of projectively flat, at least in the case of, of commutative algebras. So let's see how this works. So here, here's the, so I, I'm going to give the definition of sectional non-associativity. And I'm not actually going to give full motivation. I sort of I have some extra slides at the end that if there's time, I'll give. But if not, I, I won't show. But I, I wanted I thought I thought it was better to give the definition and go straight to examples, uh, so that one can see that it's somehow motivated. So far, the motivations have been quite naive. So here, here here's the definition. And if, if you're used to the 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 usual definition of uh, sectional curvature, this may not look familiar. But 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 somehow 
I'm actually looking at that this and using the invariance to rewrite it in this sense. Okay, so I, I think I put that, no, I didn't put that on the, well, I put that on a later slide that I had, but. So, if, and if I write it this way, um, it, it looks uh, much more like the section of curvature if I write the numerator in this form. But at any rate, it's this ratio of, the, the denominator is essentially the, if you think in the Riemannian context and the Euclidean context, this would be the, 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 the norm of the of x wedge y up to normalizations. And then you have some quadratic expression up above. And, and here the order of x and y matters is to say, in, in the commutative case, I could write this in whatever order I wanted, but in any commutative case, I have to be careful to write the order down. It's easy to check that this only depends on the span of x and y. It doesn't actually depend on, on, uh, on the choices involved. And, and I'm, in the case of a, a possibly isotropic uh, metric, I, I'm, I'm requiring that they span something H not degenerate, which is of course equivalent to the denominator being non-zero. So the, the, the basic example to think about is, is if, my, if my multiplication is commutative, this quantity is, is non-negative if and only if it satisfies this inequality, which is what's usually known as, as the Norton inequality. And, and so that's somehow gonna be the first example. Um, this is of course not a very elementary example anymore, but um, to say algebras that satisfy the Norton inequality are, are not so many are known and, and I'm not gonna give a full list of them, but, but the, the most famous one is, is the Grice algebra of the monster finite simple group. And uh, so the monster finite simple group is the, the largest of the 26 sporadic simple groups finite groups. And it, it was constructed by Grice as the automorphisms of a, of a unital metrized algebra of dimension 196,884. So the one minus this dimension is the smallest, is the dimension of the smallest non-trivial uh, representation of the, of the monster finite simple group. And, and so this is, you would join a one dimensional subspace to, to put a unit in. And it's known that this algebra satisfies the Norton inequality. I guess, I guess actually this is due to Norton. And um, it doesn't matter here uh, any special property. I'm not gonna actually say anything of any depth about this algebra, but it's just to say this is a, an example where the Norton inequality is known and it's not clear exactly what the repercussion of this inequality is. And one of the things I want to suggest is that one should somehow think of it as a positive curvature condition or a non-negative curvature condition. Um, later, Frankel, Lepowski, and Murman constructed a vertex operator algebra, so VOA abbreviates vertex operator algebra, whose automorphism group was the finite, was the monster finite simple group. And its two-graded piece is, is Grice's original algebra. Um, so here, if you if you've never seen vertex operator algebras before. Um, or you don't know much about them, it's impossible to understand anything about them in three minutes or even in three hours. And so I, I've not made definitions or really tried to say, anything. and if you, if you already know what these things are, you're familiar with these examples. So it's sort of a, it's a little bit of a tough example to give in that sense. But the point here is that in general, if you have a real vertex operator algebra, one says it's OZ and this abbreviates one zero, um, which is a way of remembering these two conditions. If it's zero graded piece is, is dimension one and it's one graded piece has dimension zero. And in this case, it's two graded pieces. It is a metrized commutative algebra automatically. And it, it was proved by Miyamoto. So, and, and in this case, this V2, this two graded piece gets called the Grice algebra, the vertex operator algebra, because this is somehow viewed as a generalization of the specific case of the, of the monster the vertex operator algebra and, and the Grice algebra of the monster. And so Miyamoto proved that the Grice algebra of a real one zero vertex operator algebra for which the, the metric is positive definite, the invariant metric is positive definite, it satisfies the Norton inequality. So exactly how many examples this gives isn't clear, but uh, among them are actually the examples uh, that are gonna be described in a few slides of the simple Euclidean Jordan algebras. So I'll come back to that, but 
the, 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 the most familiar example that fits into this is it's known that given a simple Euclidean Jordan algebra, there exists a, a vertex operator algebra of this type, which has it as a discrete Grice algebra. And I, I, I should actually have put a, a line in here uh, attributing that to the appropriate authors, but I can't right now remember um, who they are, unfortunately. It's, it's a, there's several papers which is done. But. Okay, so this is one example that, that is somehow, okay, this is the, the most interesting example. We'll start with that one, but let's see some other examples. So here, uh, what I've done is I've written the associator. Remember, this was my notation for the underlying, the symmetrized product, and this was for the anti-symmetrized product underlying. So I have my product, and then I, I'm writing it as one half of this plus this. Okay, and so here I'm writing their associators, and uh, it doesn't matter what this T is. Um, it's this T is something that vanishes if the algebra is admissible. And the point is simply, really, the, the conclusion here is that the sectional non-associativity, as defined on the previous, splits in this way. That basically it's got a contribution from the symmetric part of the algebra and a or commutative part of the algebra and a contribution from the anti-commutative part. And when you write it out, the anti-commutative part takes this somehow much simpler form than the commutative part because this this term in the in the case of an anti-commutative product vanishes because x paired with itself is zero, and then the the order here matters, so you get a positive sign here when you flip x and y with an anti-commutative product, and so you get out you get out this term in the anti-commutative side. And so let's just look at the, the case of a, an anti-commutative metrized algebra. So here your basic example is a, uh, is a Lie algebra metrized by its killing form or the negative of its killing form. Uh, observe that th this expression here is sensitive to the choice of H. If I rescale H, this expression rescales by the reciprocal of H. So the, the sign of H matters and you have to somehow Always keep that in mind when you're when you're talking about signs. Uh, the, 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 so the, the natural thing is is to when when one is speaking about signs, the natural thing is to suppose that H is positive definite, and and then one can interpret the sign of the sectional non associativity. So in the in the in the That, yeah, so you have a simple bound of the right-hand side by this, and then it's just an, a simple consequence of the Cauchy-Schwartz inequality that you can give a sort of a, a constant bound on this. I don't care right now what the, what the constant is. It, it's basically one. But I, I want to comment that in the, in the case of the algebra of, of complex n by n matrices, metrized by the usual Frobenius form, as what it gets called in the applied math literature, um, the, the naive bound on this quantity that comes from Cauchy-Schwartz can actually be improved by a factor of two. Um, and it's known how to characterize equality. And this is called the, it's called the Butcher-Wenzel inequality. Although it was actually proved, I think, by someone named Zilu. And uh, in the case for, 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 for real symmetric matrices or, or Hermitian matrices, it actually goes back to churn do Carmo and Kobayashi uh, a long time ago. And, uh, and somehow, because this inequality comes up when one looks at, at um, second fundamental forms of, of minimal submanifolds. And in fact, Lu also works somehow in that language. I wanna in interpret it as this is an upper bound on the sexual non associativity So this is somehow the other sort of non-trivial example here. So let me just state what I mean. So here I, I wanna think about a, a, a unital composition R algebra. So real numbers, complex numbers, quaternions, octonions. And uh, I'm gonna equip the N by N matrices with the usual Jordan product. And um, I, I, N is three if, if, the, if K is the octonions. So that this is actually a Jordan algebra. And I'm gonna equip it with the metric, uh, which is, this is what I called the Kozul form earlier. And then I'm, I'm, I'm normalizing it by some dimensional factor. And of course the normalization is important when you interpret the inequalities below. 
And so the, the claim is that uh, the sectional associativity in this case is always non-negative and it's bounded above by N over two. Um, and the both equality cases can be characterized. Um, at least if K is associative in, in, the, in, the, in the case of the lower bound. Uh, basically, if K is associative, you have lower, you have inequality, you have equality in the lower bound if and only if X and Y commute. In, in particular, if uh, X and its square are linearly independent, that gives you an example of a subspace which is flat in the sense that this is zero. And as, as I'll say in a minute, this is essentially the observation that, that uh, Jordan Elder Reserve power associative. Um, and the, you get equality in the upper, upper bound if and only if X and Y are somehow equivalent to certain matrices. These are the, these are the standard matrix spaces. And so, so and, and actually this characterization of equality is already essentially present in the term Dokarmo Kawayashi work. Uh, it used to have to do a little bit of work to extend that kind of stuff to, to the, Cases of the quaternions and octonions. Um, the, the point is simply that in this case, what's harder is this upper bound. The lower bound is easy. The upper, upper bound is harder. And the sharp upper bound comes from the butcher Wenzel, blue turn to Carmino, Kobayashi inequality. And, and so the point is not that anything new is being proved. It's simply that somehow, uh, as was the case with the Norton inequality, um, some, some, some standard results are somehow fit nicely with the perspective. Okay, so, so let's, here I just wanted to mention a, 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 a problem. Um, if, if I think of a compact semi-simple real algebra uh, with, a, this, is, this is digression, as it says here, uh, with, with its killing form. Um, and so I can look at the supremum of the sexual non-associativities. So here I'm, I'm taking the sectional non-associativity of the metric given by the negative killing form. And I, by the cauchy schwartz inequality, this, this number exists, it's finite. And, and it's, it's, its value is a basic automorphism invariant of G. And just the comment is that at least for SON and SUN, you can calculate it if you, um, it follows from the same butcher renzel inequality. And the, the, the question is, what is it for, for general compact simple G? This is something that, uh, somebody who enjoys doing case-by-case -case checks. I mean, somebody who is good with roots should be able to work this out. But I'm, I'm, it, the, the real comment here is I'm surprised that in some sense, this or something equivalent I can't find in the literature for general G. Um, and I, I know specific references for this, this particular case. If anybody's interested, I can give them to them later. But it's just an aside. This is a problem that somehow, a question that somehow suggested by this. So let me let me now go to a sort of simpler examples just to show what, what this notion of sexual non-associativity really means. So if we have an alternative algebra, that means that these are both zero and it, that immediately implies that the sexual non-associativity is, is zero. And in fact, for a, a metrized alternative algebra, they're, they're equivalent as, as I state down here at the bottom. And the proof is simply this. If I, if I look at this quantity by the invariance of H, it's equivalent to this. And, and then it's equivalent to this. And, and that's what was the numerator in the sectional non-associativity. And, and then just going through, you also get out this. And so you see that the, the numerator in the sectional non-associativity definition is zero. Well, exactly if uh, these, these things are both zero. This is using the non-degeneracy of H, of course. And so in some sense, what you're really picking up is, is, is whether your algebra is, so I'm calling it sexual non-associativity. I guess the comment here is you could have called it maybe sexual non -multiple. It's essentially, you're detecting alternativity, but um, This old theorem of Arden is telling you that in some sense, if you're only looking at two-dimensional subspaces, there's not really much difference. Um, okay, so, so essentially flat means associative or alternative. 
So flat is supposed to mean vanishing sexual non-association. So here, here's just this is a, this is a, a special case of the proceeding, although maybe it's not obviously so, but it gives you a way of writing down some examples that, that are a bit stranger. If you have a, a metrized two nilpotently algebra, um, it has vanishing sexual non-associativity. The proof is really easy. Uh, this quantity just equals this by the invariance of H, and that's zero because you're assuming two nilpotents. Now, the only problem with this is a source of examples is there's two things I wanted to comment here, really. One is that, of course, a general two-step nilpotent algebra need not admit an invariant metric. The simplest example is the Heisenberg algebra in any odd dimension. It's easy to see if it's no invariant metric. But um, one can write down examples on, on say, the semi-direct product of a, of the algebra and it's and it's dual. Uh, in this case, the, the, there's it's. I mean, I'm not going to write down the definition here of the split signature invariant metric, but if I tell you that there is one, you can all of you can go home and write it down. Um, and in the case that G is two-step null potent, then then this is a this semi-direct product is two-step null potent as well, and so you get examples that way. But the the, these examples are never going to be Euclidean. As I say, if I'm working over R, I can never get a positive definite metric this way because I always have a non-trivial isotropic subspace. The, the other comment here is that as this is related to what Vladimir asked earlier, the, the H here is not a trace form. It can't be. Uh, were it, I would have a semi-simple Lie algebra. So, 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 um, these examples are somehow, they're there, but, but you have to think about where they fit in the general zoo. The next uh, just comment is, is that uh, the, the classical notion of cross product algebra is, is very, very close to having constant sectional non-associativity one for, for anti-symmetric algebras. Any, I, sh I should have said anti-commutative here, not anti-symmetric, but they should say commutative, anti-commutative. Um, so for those that aren't, don't remember, a cross product algebra is one which satisfies, it's an anti-symmetric multiplication that satisfies anti-commutative multiplication, satisfies this identity here. And, and this is motivated by the classical cross product in R3, which satisfies this identity. And, and, and then it was proved by Brown, Gray, Ekman uh, that uh, a real cross product algebra has dimension three or seven. And it's, it's, um, it's um, it's inertial indices. It's either it's positive definite or it's it's split, essentially. I mean, split, it's one, two, or three, four signature. So I'm writing the plus inertial index first. And uh, in general, examples are any 3D unimodular Lie algebra that's, that's for which the killing form is not degenerate. So if you're thinking over R, you're talking about SL2 and SO3. Those are your basic examples. And, and then the seven dimensional simple malt of algebras, for instance, the imaginary Actonians. And I, I'm not interested here in, in detailing the, the, um, the complete list of what these are, but. but um, and so then the, the claim is that um, this is equivalent to constant sectional non associativity for the, for the well, let me say it again. A metrized anti-commutative algebra is cross product algebra if and only if it has constant sectional non associativity one. And the reason I need to assume an infinite field here is that in the constant sectional non associativity asserts uh, that, that this is a constant, that this, this thing here is a constant, or equivalently, that the numerator is equal to the denominator. And so to conclude from that, um, the, the cross product identity, you, you, in general, you need some kind of a risky density argument. And so that's where this probably unnecessary infinite field assumption is entering. It's to say that to go between some purely tensorial identity and the constant non-sectional, the constant sectional non-associativity condition, one direction requires some sort of a risky density argument, and at least the way I make the arguments. And, and so that needs an infinite field. And a little more generally, you, you, if you have an anisotropic metric, uh, this condition is, is true if, if and only if you have a cross product algebra, the, the sectional non associativity equal to one. 
And so the point is simply that you could define cross product algebras as metrized anti commutative algebras of constant sexual non associations if you want. So it's, it's a it's an alternative point of view. Here's a, an example uh, that's neither commutative nor anti commutative. It's it, although it's built from this is, this is going to be an example of, of a three dimensional algebra, which is has got uh, constant uh, sexual non associativity equals zero. It's basically built from a commutative one of constant sexual non associativity one, and, uh, of, uh, sorry, a commutative one of constant sexual non associativity minus one, and an any commutative one of constant sexual non associativity plus one. And as we saw earlier, uh, here, the sexual non-associativities of the full algebra is given in terms of these underlying ones. And it just sums. So if this one is minus one and this one is one, I get zero on the right-hand side. So that's what motivates the example. And what it is, well, the underlying any commutative bracket is simply uh, the standard cross product on, on K3 or SO3. And the underlying commutative product is the same thing, but without signs. So all that's changed here are the signs. And uh, this, this fits into a general class I'll discuss later. And, and so it's the sum of these two things. And so that just kills the second term in each. So it just gives me the, the product of X and Y would be this, this, and this times two. And it's invariant, it's invariant with respect to what looks like the usual Euclidean metric. And here I'm just commenting that it's it's actually anti-flexible. So anti-flexible means that it is uh, symmetric in X and Z, the associator. Is, is that the right? That's the right. That's what I want to say. And uh, a pretty straightforward computation shows that this algebra has, has vanishing sexual non-associativity. And there's an analogous example with SL2. Um, in place of SO3. And this can actually be found in an old paper of someone named Crozier. Um, the, the algebra, not, not, not any discussion of sexual non associativity or anything of the sort, but it's a paper on anti flexible algebras. And, and if, if one, one can reinterpret his example as essentially the same construction I'm doing here, but starting from SO2 instead of SO3. So you have to think about what the right algebra to put in on the commutative side is. But um, again, it's it's completely straightforward and you get out a similar sort of example. And there there should be, I, I would suspect that there's a similar example of starting with the imaginary Octonians, but I don't know it. And it would be interesting to know it. And then, Here's one last family of examples before I start stating some, some theorems. Um, this is a family of three-dimensional commutative algebras. So, uh, and here's its multiplication table in terms of a basis. So if it, it's probably easier to think in terms of the left multiplication, the multiplication endomorphisms, which look like this. And so you, you think of this epsilon as a parameter and the algebras that are constructed here they're pairwise non-isomorphic except except uh, except with respect to flipping the sign on, on this epsilon. So if you're working, say, over the real numbers where it makes sense to speak of positivity, you can you can make this a, a one parameter family of pairwise non-isomorphic algebras by requiring the epsilon be positive. Th these are never exact in the sense that I mentioned earlier. The trace of this left multiplication endomorphism is never zero. And this this metric this metric this Euclidean looking metric is is always invariant. That's a computation that one has to do. And these examples are are interesting because, well, if you compute the this is the associator endomorphism, and it works out to be this, and it can be written in this way in terms of the metric. So it's it's almost they're almost associative. They're they're somehow their associator is pure trace in terms of the metric, and it follows easily from this that the the, the Ricci tensor, which is just the trace of this endomorphism is a multiple of the metric. So this is what I called the Einstein-like condition earlier. And it's, it can be checked that the sexual non-associativity in this case is one quarter minus epsilon squared. So this gives you a, if you think over the real numbers, this gives you a one parameter family of, of, of 
commutative algebra is a sectional, constant sectional non-associativity, which is positive for epsilon in some range, zero for epsilon equal to a half, and, and negative for, for bigger epsilon. And one can prove that these are simple, uh, except when epsilon is one half, and that they are, um, as I said, they're pairwise non-isomorphic, except up to this ambiguity of sign. And if you're wondering, um, what else did I want to say about these algebras? Um, there was something else I want to say about these algebras. These algebras actually come from thinking about uh, affine connections on the three sphere. But um, at any rate, that's. So let me give. So this is the last sort of concrete example before I start saying this is an example of, of, of uh, a family of algebras that in every dimension n uh, have constant negative sectional non-associativity um, when, when it makes sense to speak of negative. So I want to think of Kn, the field to the nth power with the, the, the pointwise product. So this is just the dumbest possible thing. I have this linear form with this is missing the xi's. It's just the, it's a, some, some, some sort of trace, right? Puzzle form. And we define a perturbed uh, commutative product. Uh, just So this is the usual pointwise multiplication of above. And we're just perturbing it by this linear form. And it's easy to check that this algebra is exact and it's metrized by its killing form, which takes this form. Uh, and that over the real numbers, this is a positive definite in general, it's not a degenerate. Uh, the, the, the way that this algebra is usually presented is, is uh, it's generated by n plus one idempotents. These are literally the usual coordinate vectors in, in, in Kn and, and their, their products uh, satisfy this identity and they sum to zero. Well, I, I've added in, I've added in an, an n plus first one, which is just minus the sum of all of the EIs. That's what E zero is. Okay, so you have these n plus one item points. And the point is that the, one can prove that the homomorphism group of this algebra is the symmetric group on n plus one elements acting as permutations of these item points. And the n equals two case is isomorphic to the usual para Hurwitz algebra, which is the complex numbers with this isotopic uh, multiplication given, given by the, the conjugation. And it's, it's, it's a computation to show that this has a constant negative sexual non-associativity when metrized by its, by its uh, killing form. And I've called these, I call these simplicial algebras because of this relation down here, but they were actually studied by Grice and Harada in the 1970s as a, b before the work on the monster finite simple group, there was sort of a program to, to realize uh, Finite, all, all finite simple groups as automorphism groups of some canonically defined class of commutative algebras that was somehow never really completed and then later grew into vertex operator algebra theory. But um, this is somehow the simplest example in that line of thinking. And uh, I'm gonna explain uh, that somehow, to, from my point of view, it's a very fundamental example. And, and that, that's gonna come now. So, so this apparent uh, non sequitur about unilization is related to explaining how this example has something to do with the general sexual non-associativity. So let me just quickly state this. Uh, I, if I'm given a, an algebra and, and uh, so here, here I am, I'm thinking of a commutative algebra and, and I have a symmetric bilinear form, I'm, I'm adding, I'm adding a one dimensional piece to it. So I'm, I'm adjoining a, an idempotent or a unit in this case, uh, and he, here's how I'm extending the multiplication, and here's how I, I'm extending the bilinear form. And it's easy to see that when I do this, that well, it makes zero one into a unit upstairs. And so the upstairs is written with this hat, and the, the upstairs, this lifted bilinear form is invariant if uh, with respect to the upstairs multiplication if and only if the, so you, you should think of this as a hat, zero hat is somehow fibering. It's, you know, that's what I mean by upstairs, downstairs. And um, what, when I speak of a metrized commutative algebra, I just, by its, uni by its unitization, I mean that determined by the given metric. 
And uh, there, here there's a, an observation that if this is explaining how the sexual non-associativities are related, um, basically, if, if R and S are zero, in other words, if I restrict to, to elements of the upstairs algebra that come from the downstairs algebra, this is just saying that the sexual non-associativity increases by one. And so there's a very, very simple relationship. So sometimes it's more convenient to work with a unit. Sometimes it's more convenient to work without a unit. But um, we saw that with the Grice algebra examples earlier. We had to work with the unit. Okay, so the, the relevance of this is it's related to this notion of projective associativity, which I define here. So I, I said earlier that I wanted to think of constant next not sectional curvature as, as projective flatness of the levy chivita connection. So I want to think of constant net non sectional non-associativity as projective associativity. So this actually makes sense. So the basic definition of projective associativity is that there's some bilinear, symmetric bilinear form. So this is for commutative algebra now. So a, a proper development of this for general algebra is, is perhaps uh, is, a, is a different matter, but. Something like this makes sense for in the generality of flexible Lie admissible algebras. But, but uh, I'm just going to, for simplicity, I'm just talking about commutative algebras. So I'm going to call it projectively associative if, if its associator is essentially pure trace. It, and, and, and in this case, when I trace this, it means that C is, in fact, essentially the Ricci form up to a dimensional constant. And then here, what I've done is I've written several other ways of, of, of writing the same condition. But what, what's a little less obvious is, it, is it's equivalent to the unit, the unitalization using this C of the algebra as associatives. It's, it's a, the non-trivial part of all this is that, that, that in, if you satisfy this condition, then C and hence also the Ricci form is automatically invariant. That's, that's no longer, that requires a little bit of work. Um, People who've seen these kinds of things probably know how to do it, but it, it's. And then if you if you're, uh, you always have to assume this condition on the characteristic because of this of this factor here. But module of that assumption, it's the same thing as assuming that th this uh, this tensor is is uh, is zero, and this is like the projective vial tensor in the in the for a connection. It's this analogous thing for an associator. Um, I'll go way, way, way back here to where I was talking about curvature just to make a comment here. Uh, where did I have it? Here. The curvature of an algebra was like this, but if my algebra is commutative, then um, why, why I'm trying to say, let's see. I'm not going to make the remark. I'm, never mind. Let me go forward. And, and here I'm commenting that, I mean, for representation theoretic reasons, something like this vanishes automatically in two dimensions. So it's, it's, it's the case that a two-dimensional algebra, commutative algebra is always projectively associated, this should say commutative, is always projectively associated. And that's actually not, um, it's, it's, it's less obvious to prove than it looks. Um, anyway, let's go on. So. Here's the algebraic analog of the Beltrami theorem. Um, so I recall that the classical Beltrami theorem said that a pseudo Riemannian manifold has constant sectional curvature can only if it's locally projectively flat. So here, modulus some assumptions on the field. Um, a metrized commutative algebra has constant sectional non associativity if and only if it's projectively associative. And in this case, it's Ricci metrized, which I think of as sort of like the Einstein condition. And if it's exact, well, then it's in fact a killing metrized because the Ricci tensor and the killing tensor are the same up to sign in the exact case. And the reason I have to assume an infinite field is, is, is again, there's some Jarisky density argument in one of the directions. Maybe constant sectional non associativity is, is, is what is, it's not a purely tensorial condition because it involves a, a, a ratio of. Tensorial expressions. Okay, and and so let me skip that slide and just say these Grice Harada algebras that I that I defined a few slides back. These ones, they are characterized as 
so if, if I'm over an algebraically closed field or, or the real numbers, an n-dimensional commutative algebra is isomorphic to this simplicial grice ferrata algebra, if and only if it's exact, killing metroid, and predictably associated. So somehow these, these sort of geometrically motivated conditions single out this class of algebras, commutative algebras, which have as their automorphism groups the, the, the symmetric groups. And, and as I say here in the comment, what's important to me here is the formulation rather than the proof. The proof is easy. Uh, basically, projectively associative and exact imply killing invariance. And the, by the intrinsic unilization, I mean that defined using the appropriate multiple of the Ricci form, in this case, the, the killing form. It, it, that's associative by the projectively associative assumption. And it's killing metrized because you just have to check that when you lift the killing form downstairs, you get the killing form upstairs. And, and then it's easy to describe the, the killing metrized the associative algebras. And where these assumptions on the field enter in is, is, is you want to conclude that you actually have a direct sum of, of K itself rather than, you, so somehow these assumptions on the field are to exclude any kind of interest in Galois theory. Um, Okay, so that, that's simple, but really what, what matters here is the, is the formulation. So the, the, if I drop exact, uh, then this is no longer true. Here's a class of algebras on the preceding slide that are very similar. Uh, I can define them, I have n idempotents and they satisfy this. So for the simplicial algebras, this was one over n minus one. But in general, I can put in an arbitrary uh, number here. And, uh, and the, the point is simply, this gives me a family of algebras which are projectively associative. And except for some values of the parameter, they're going to be Ricci metrized. And, um, and, but they're exact if and only if you have this particular value of the parameter. And so the, 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 if I drop this exact, so, and I asked, what are the projectively associative algebras? I, I don't know the answer to that question. And I know other examples that don't, that don't, there are other examples. So already that's an interesting problem is, is, is the classification, classify the projectively associative um, algebras with uh, up to field theoretic data. Um, and this is something I've thought about some, but I can't say anything definitive. Let me just conclude. I have, I think, two or three minutes to go. Uh, let me just conclude with a couple comments about structural consequences of assumptions. So this is going to be working over R, if you like, or more generally Euclidean field. And and it's maybe let me just skip to the next slide that state the theorem, and then and then we'll we'll see how it's proved. The the claim here is that uh, the, the that it really, this is the, this, the main conclusion that, that negative sectional non associativity applies to finite automorphism for metrized commutative algebra. And so, the way I think about this is that if you think about compact Riemann surfaces, for instance, and you ask which ones have, uh, uh, what are their automorphism groups? If the genus is at least two, uh, the, the regimen of, of the hyperbolic regimen, the negative curvature regimen, then they have finite automorphism groups. The only time you can get uh, big automorphism groups, so to speak, is in the positive curvature realm on the sphere or on the torus. And, uh, and, and you have a slight, if you assume non-positive sectional associativity, you get either finite so the automorphism group or, or that you have a trivial subalgebra of dimension two. In, fa in fact, this case can be, you don't need to write this, it's a corollary to work on the next slide. Um, do you have a trivial subalgebra dimension too? And this, the, the proof here follows from some previous results of Suzuki on automorphisms of, of uh, symmetric forms on, on algebras. Basically, um, let me see here. What, uh, yeah, so the, the, other, the other kind of structural consequence that one can deduce from these sorts of sexual non-associativity assumptions, you know, positive or negative, are, so nil two means the square zero elements. So two or two nil potents. So we're in a commutative algebra. And what these results are saying is, and then the, the item potents, 
So what these results are saying are, uh, if, if you're in a, a real uh, Euclidean metrized community of algebra, so it's got a positive definite metric and it's real, the, if you have a, a, a square zero element in its complexification, um, then, and, and the, the real and imaginary parts of the element are linearly independent, then they span a subspace with non-negative sectional non-associativity. And, and you have equality if and only if it's a trivial subalgebra. So that somehow operates in the theorem on the, on the other slide. And likewise, if you have an item potent in the complexified algebra, um, and again, it's real imaginary parts are linearly independent, then, then, then uh, the sectional non-associativity is actually positive on, on, uh, on those. And, and so th another way of saying these things is that non-positive sectional non-associativity is forcing the idempotence and, and square zero elements in the complexification are, are just multiples of, of idempotence and square zero elements in the underlying algebra. And, and somehow this kind of, this kind of uh, conclusion uh, is used in the context of say the Grice algebra, the monster finite simple group. And it goes back to, to, to it goes back to a paper of, of Meyer and Neutsch, somehow these kinds of observations as consequences of Norton inequality. But here the, the other kind of conclusion I can get is then if I have a, uh, uh, a Euclidean metrized community of algebra with, with some non-negativity assumption on sectional non-associativity, I can rule out square zero elements a priori. Um, and, and in particular, I guess, so for instance, this gives you some abstract way of seeing that a, the, the, the Jordan algebra of a simple, a simple Euclidean Jordan algebra has no two nil potents, which you, you knew anyway. But you, you can argue again. Th this maybe the conclusion here is 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 not so great in the sense that the hypothesis maybe is harder to check than the conclusion is. But but uh, it's more the the philosophy I think that's behind this, which is the idea is that is that one can one can try to to group the 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 world of 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 at least in the metrized. Um, non-associative algebras using principles that come, that are sort of quantitative and, and partial non-associativity measures that one, one wants to try to say, say so, so for instance, what, what do I mean? A condition like constant sectional non-associativity is kind of a specific kind of non-associativity, but it has, it, it, and it's, it's given by an equality. It already has a flavor a bit different than the, the, the usual way of looking at non-associativity. But if, if I'm working at least over real algebras, for instance, and I say something like a bound on sexual non-associativity, I'm really dealing with a different kind of condition than, than, than what one classically thinks about. And, and I think that it, it's potentially a, a, an interesting line. And my objective in this talk was simply to give a bunch of examples to show that Something's going on, and and uh, to to suggest that uh, it's worth studying, and and I think that uh, I will stop there because it's it's time. So. Okay, thank you very much, Dan. And uh, well, there's some quick question because sure. we have run out of time. <laughs> okay, I'm sorry. I, I don't have a clock on my screen. No, no don't worry. <laughs> Okay, any question? Actually, I was going to ask you, you mentioned mm -hmm. that the uh, Hurvis algebras were uh, metrized algebras, but, but uh, the invariance of the uh, norm is, doesn't hold. The, the, oh. the ones that are metrized are the para Hurvis, I believe. Oh, probably, let's see, was I being, yeah so okay it's probably you mean way back here yeah, uh yeah. it's invariant yeah well so actually this is where i was um it's actually invariant in um in, in a different way yes in a different in, in uh this sense 
Yeah, yeah, exactly. yeah exactly. and the, actually a lot of this. So, uh, so I, yeah, you're correct. Um, the how it of course is, you're correct. Uh, but the point is actually a, a lot of this notion should actually make sense in the context of metrized algebras of involution. Yeah. Um, and yeah, so sometimes, uh, yes. So, so what Alberto is saying is that um, this example should have been omitted. No, but, but <laughs> no, no, but but, but it, no, it, well, because it doesn't, it doesn't, yeah. And what fits neatly in here are the Parahorowitz, yes, exactly. the, the Parahorowitz algebras, which are where you define the the multiplication this way, which I mean, we saw an example like that, and then then that's invariant in the sense I'm working. Yeah, yes. yeah, yeah. yeah. And, uh, and and I this is the, what happens when you write examples on slides without thinking enough. Yes. Thank thank you. Yes. <laughs> Any other comment or question? Okay. If not, let's thank the speaker again. Thank you for this interesting talk. And 